right, it's my pleasure to be introducing our uh, seminar speaker today, uh, Captain John Stockwell uh, from the U.S. Navy uh, retired. Uh, he received his uh, bachelor's degree in 1983 and then was immediately commissioned into the, uh, the U.S. Navy uh, from the U.S. Naval Officers Training Corps at UC Berkeley. Uh, he has vast experience, uh, sort of over 4,000 flight hours, sort of flying all sorts of uh, uh, aircrafts that I'm not even going to try to mention. Okay. Uh, he's sort of uh, been a leader in that field uh, within within the Navy. Uh, sort of a few highlights, he was, um, uh, sort of he, uh, was uh, sort of instrumental in the procurement of the MH-60S helicopter, if any of you know about it. Uh, at the Military Director of Systems Engineering um, at, uh, at the Naval Air Warfare Center. Uh, he retired from the Navy in 2012 uh, and then uh, worked for uh, a few small businesses. A small company. A small yeah. company, mm -hmm. sort of, uh, again, supporting naval operations. Uh, and then uh, in 2022, it was uh, uh, sort of uh, our great fortune for, for him to join yeah. the University of Maryland. Uh, he's now uh, the director of U.S. research uh, at UROC uh, down in southern Maryland. I'm very, very uh, excited to huh? uh, to have uh, John over and okay. tell us all about uh, Drone 101. All right, what we do. Okay, well, thanks. All right, well, thanks. Um, welcome. So, that's me, Joy. <laughs> you know, I've been with the university now for a bit over a year, and um, you know, if you're, if you're not familiar, so St. Mary's County is about an hour and 15 minutes south of here. Uh, if you just basically get on Route 5 and head south till it ends, you'll, you'll hit us um, down there. Um, and so we have some facilities down there we'll talk to you about. Um, really, this is the agenda here. So we'll talk a little bit about who we are. So what is the UROC? Uh, what do we do down there? You know, where, where are we? And, you know, what kind of airspace do we operate in? Uh, what sort of equipment do we have? Um, we'll talk about some of the projects we've worked on in the past and things that we have going on now and some things that are coming in the future and how we can help with research that's going on around here. So, so y'all are associated with the Robotics Center, right? Okay, so you come from different, uh, different engineering backgrounds than I would assume, right? So what are some of the areas that you're all interested in? Perception. Yeah. Controls. Controls, yeah. All right. Yeah. So um, one of the things that, that I'm here to do is just to, to make you all aware of what, what we have. You know, obviously you all are got some familiarity with drones. I'm, I'm not going to start, you know, with maybe I would, you know, with a, with a freshman class um, on that. But I, I do want to talk a little bit about what we're doing specifically. So, um, so, so we're part of aerospace engineering as far as the organization goes. And, um, and so the, 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 the UAS test sites the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, uh, back in 2014, they, they, they ran a competition nationwide to establish a set of, of formally commissioned UAS test sites uh, under their purview. Um, University of Maryland participated along with Rutgers and Virginia Tech in, in an organization they called the Mid-Atlantic Aviation Partnership that competed in that. Um, you know, it's a long story, I wasn't here, but you know, we were part of that at one point. That, that group kind of fell apart eventually, and the UAS test site at St. Mary's County Airport for University of Maryland um, became an independent entity of its own and, and has some state funding to keep it going. Um, in the last year I took over, we, uh, we, we decided to redesignate as a research and ops center. Uh, we do test, we do a lot of flight testing, but we do a lot more than that as well. And so that's the origin. St. Mary's County Airport, you can see in the picture there, that's just an overhead view circled on there. We've got a really nice facility down there. Um, small staff of uh, seven per, per permanent personnel, um, along with myself and an administrative director, a couple of program project managers, and I've got some engineers and some UAS operators down there. So what do they do? Um, yeah, as you would expect, they fly drones. And so um, we have several Part 107 certified uh, operators down there. Um, the engineers and operators travel all over the world, as you'll see. And they have really strong knowledge of FAA rules. So anyone in here done any FAA quals? Anything? Yeah? What is, what is yours? Have you done 107, SMART? Or what is, what is, private pilot. You got a private pilot? Oh, that's awesome. What did you fly? 
uh, well, it's been a number of years, but the biggest was um, a twin engine. Oh, wow. Uh, I think it was a Piper. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Anybody here flown drones? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, got any certifications for those? No? Okay. So, um, you know, and that's, that's one of the things that if you're doing research involving drones, as soon as that thing leaves the ground, you're immediately subject to the rules in the federal aviation regulations. Doesn't matter where you are, um, you know, as soon as it's an inch off the ground, you're in the national airspace, believe it or not, and those rules apply. Um, there's, even for recreational use, there, there are certain requirements that are out there. You're supposed to have some training. It's very basic. It's a one hour online course. You can get this qualification. Um, then part 107 is a little more in depth. That's a little more like a pilot's license. But it's still, compared to a private pilot license, it's fairly simple, fairly straightforward. So anyway, our guys, though, have a lot of uh, experience, not only with that, but they've operated in the commercial industry. They've operated uh, drones all over the world and are very familiar with the rules. So if you're going to be operating drones as part of any projects, um, you know, you can lean into them. You can ask them for help. You can get advice. They, they, they work with student teams all the time. Some of you may have Josh Gauss. He's, he's down there and, and helps with a lot of the student teams that are out there. So this is just a kind of a quick overview of the airspace that we operate in. If you're familiar with aerial charts, you'll know that's pretty complicated airspace. And so um, we actually sit at the St. Mary's County Airport, which is just outside um, what's called restricted airspace that belongs to the Navy down there. Um, that lets us operate a little bit more freely. We've got, um, but, but we, we operate locally down there. We've operated all over the United States, all over the world. In the last year, our folks have been in Hawaii, they've been in New Zealand, they've been in Australia, they've also been in Nome, Alaska in the middle of winter. So it, we'll go where, where the work is, where the projects are, um, supporting different agencies. So what do we do? First off, research and education support. So getting research up in the air. So a drone is typically going to be, kind of think of it as a truck, getting, getting a payload up in the air. That's normally what people want to do. It isn't usually working on a different design of an airframe or redesigning a current airframe. It's, it's getting something up in the air. So we, we do a lot of that. We work with uh, a lot of STEM and outreach in the local area, but we also come up here where you'll see us around on campus. We were here at Maryland Day last year. We'll be back. We're going to be here a little later, a couple of weeks from now, over here at the airport for the Latinas and Aviation event that's going on there. And we travel around. We've got, you'll see uh, later on, a, a mobile operations center that we bring around for those kinds of things. Um, we work operationally with a lot of different agencies and we'll talk some more about that but we do collaborative projects uh, and this is the kind of work we're working with NASA we're working with NOAA we're working with the Navy and the Army Department of Homeland Security sometimes with state agencies the state police Department of Transportation and sometimes locally you know we're working with the agriculture extension here at the University and others so we do a lot of that kind of work and then we have a long-term initiative going on, a, a, a project called the Chesapeake UAS Route Network. So getting back to that whole FAA thing, you know, flying drones in the national airspace, you know, as a recreational pilot and being careful with them, you can do a lot of things. You can take them out. But as soon as you take a nickel for doing any of that stuff, you've crossed the boundary and you've got to be a Part 107 qualified pilot in order to do that legally. And, you know, is the FAA running around looking for you? They're not. But, you know, they, 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 if, they, if they find out you're doing something illegitimate, there are some potential penalties. Um, so a lot of that's around making sure that you've got line of sight to aircraft. When you're flying a drone, you got to be able to see it the whole time it's in the air. That's Part 107 rules. And so we're working on this Chesapeake UAS route network to try to help expand the airspace rules and help with uh, national efforts going on to operate a little more broadly outside that line of sight. Okay, so a little more detail there. So we've got the, you know, we, we've got a principle or a thought process that says, if you bring in, you know, that the kind of experience that UROC has to a project using drones early on in your project, we can help make sure things go smoothly for you down the way. And so you're not gonna get tripped up by any of these FAA rules. 
you know, you're not going to be going down and grabbing a, a drone down at, at Best Buy, figuring you're going to pretty easily integrate something into it, and then finding out the hard way later that you didn't budget the time or the money for what it's really going to take. And so we can help with that. Um, you know, these things, as I said before, I think normally these are about the payloads, you know, and so often those commercial drones can be modified. Uh, if they can't, you know, we've also got a couple of solutions that we have in-house for, uh, for some kind of tailor-made drones, and we'll show you those in a minute. Um, we can help you select the right equipment. So which, which drones are best suited for what you're going to do? You know, it depends. Um, you know, sometimes you want something that's up in the air for a long time loitering. That might be a fixed wing. Other times you need it to hover, then that's probably going to be a multi-copter. Um, if you've got, you know, it, it, if you've got, you know, some constraints in areas that you want to look at, you know, we'll, we'll steer you in the right directions. And then again, back to the rules. These are just some of the things that, that we've done. There's a couple pictures here on the far left. That is a prototype, um, one of our engineers, you know, having watched these kinds of projects year after year and seen, you know, the challenges that come up with trying to integrate projects into these commercially available small UASs um, and the way that trips up the student teams, that trips up research projects late in the game often, said, well, what are, the, what, what are really is most needed in these? You know, what characteristics of a drone? Well, first of all, I want to keep it cheap. Uh, second, we want to make sure that it stays, you know, we've got as max time up in the air as we possibly can. Um, usually the payloads are pretty small, so it doesn't need to be huge. It doesn't need to lift a tremendous amount. So he kind of built those parameters up. He came up with a design um, that can be 3D printed very inexpensively. Really, that whole drone there is made out of just, you know, typical 3D printing materials, plus some carbon fiber tubes and then hand tools, and then the kind of components, the autopilots, the radios, and so forth you can buy online. You know, for less than $1,000, you know, you can make a, a drone that's got about an hour of endurance, you know, with, with a, you know, a reasonably sized payload. And that evolved down to the one in the lower center. That's what he's calling the Chimera drone. So this is now being used on several projects here locally. Um, you know, one that Dr. Paley is doing right now called Artemis, if you've heard of the Artemis project. Uh, and then, you know, the Chimera drone is going to get folded into that thing in the future. Um, we've used it for our intern projects that I'm going to talk about over the last summer. We've used it for some courses that have been given down at the Smart Building at, at St. Mary's. So it, it's starting to already bear some fruit. Um, over on the far right, that just shows um, the, uh, a project, or not even a project, that was just us helping out. Um, a professor and some students working out of the uh, out of GIS, you know, they've got a pretty nice drone. They've gone out, they, they're pretty proficient in operating that system, but they were having trouble with it. They, would, they, they took it off, the thing crashed. They didn't know what was going on with it. They patched it back up, took it off, crashed. Didn't know what was going on with it. So we said, hey, okay, yeah, bring it on down. So they brought it on down to us and we took a look at it. We were able to help them find the problems that they were having with that system and, um, and also work with them a little bit on, you know, being a little more proficient in their operational skills. And from what I understand, we haven't had any problems since. So we can help out with those kind of issues as well. So with the, yeah. the Chimera, uh, so Artemis, of course, like uh, yeah. some of us are involved in Artemis and we've been talking to about integrating Chimera perhaps as the next uh, yep. platform in there. But outside of Artemis, if we wanted to use Chimera, so yep. what would the process there be? It's real simple. So, so it's an open source, it was designed to be an open source design. So the CAD files are available and um, you know, just contact us, we can help you out with that. So we, we have a number of them. They're in all different colors because we're using up some of the uh, filament we had on hand. So we get different colorful ones. but. Um, you know, we can either help to, 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 to tailor that thing up or simply send you know, the designs down and build your own. Okay. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's the whole idea. Quick question. Yeah. What, what's the dimensions for it? What's the what? Dimensions. Um, so, well, I don't know exactly, but, but the whole drone, you know, the, the rotor span, I guess I'll call it, is probably around here. And, you know, um, it's about, you know, half a kilo kind of load, I think, payload. So it's not huge, you know, but it's it's pretty substantial enough. And, and, you know, again, it's optimized for endurance. So, 
Um, it doesn't have any gimbals built into it. It doesn't, you know, although you could put them on there if you wanted to. It's very flexible that way. You can put whatever you want on for autopilot. Um, you can, uh, it's, it's completely modular. So as far as what you're going to do with it, yeah, there are a lot of options. So we work with undergrads too. So that was, um, you know, as I think I mentioned already, the student teams. So, you know, you may have read recently about the AMAV team and, you know, the Gambit and, the, and the, that pretty cool prize they won out there with, with NIST. That's pretty amazing stuff. Um, so our project engineer, Josh Gals, who was along with Dr. Paley, the advisors on that team. And so, um, you know, he and others are, he's going to help again with advising this, this upcoming Vertical Flight Society student team. We're looking to try to rein, reinvigorate the student UAS competition. This is, this is an international competition that runs down near us in Southern Maryland. The Navy sponsored it historically, but in the, over the last two years now, it's happening right at St. Mary's County Airport, where, where we are based. And um, we're looking to get the University of Maryland back into that. Unfortunately, you know, we're kind of like the home team, and we, we haven't had a team for a few years now. So we want to get that changed. And maybe looking at trying to bring together that VFS team with the student UAS uh, um, we think that it may very well be the case that the same airframe could potentially be used for both. And so maybe just with, you know, programmed and designed to behave a little differently. So, so those are some of the things we do for student teams. We, we, we've helped other university teams as well um, that reach out to us. We tend to be pretty generous with our time and our help. We do internships every summer down in, in, in Southern Maryland. Um, the way these work, and in fact, there, if you go to our website, you'll see there's an application process on there. Um, internships are 10 weeks. They're paid internships down in St. Mary's. Um, they're research-type internships. They're not, you know, kind of like extended job interviews. So you come up with your own idea for a project that you want to do involving UAS. Um, so that could be to redesign or to build a brand new UAS for some reason from the ground up. That may be a payload that you want to take up in the sky. That may be, as we had last summer, uh, we had an intern who was working on cybersecurity and trying to put an intrusion detection system onto a drone. Many of these small drones have nothing like that. And so the project is up to you. You come up with an idea for a project, you find a faculty sponsor or someone with similar kind of experience. And then you, know, you propose that, you send a resume, um, and it goes into our selection process, and we're doing rolling uh, admissions or rolling uh, applications this year. So it's open now. Um, if if selected, you know you get the option to come to uh, the opportunity to work down there out of the UROC uh, full time over the course of ten weeks in the summer. Paid internships, as I said, as University of Maryland employees for the summer. Um, we help with finding accommodation down there if you don't live locally or don't want to commute. Um, and it's, it's really a pretty good deal. Um, one of the things we do too is, uh, is teach project management as part of that. So uh, one of the things you're all going to find when you get out of school and you get into your jobs and start working in the real world is that it's all about cost performance and schedule, you know, and, and managing those three things and balancing them off. So we talk to that all the way through this project because you come down, you know you got this 10-week schedule. You know, you've come up with your own performance objectives and then our engineers would work with you to help refine those objectives to get them down to something that's potentially doable in the space of 10 weeks. And then we give you a small budget to work with and so we'll buy the components, the things you need that we don't already have on hand so you can do your project. And then by the end of summer, get that thing up in the air. Uh, just some pictures from the recent go around. So um, that's on the far left. That's our workshop there. Um, so I was working on a project for um, Dr. Avi. Uh, this was a uh, three aircraft that were all up at the same time. Um, the idea was that you know you've got an intruder in some airspace where it doesn't belong. The other two were working together to you know, get it cornered, basically corralled into a corner of some airspace. And so they did that autonomously. It was, it was pretty successful. Um, the next one over, uh, Jatin, uh, actually from Purdue University. 
and his project was actually building a drone. So that's kind of, you can see it in construction there on the far right, that's it all built with the little blue control surfaces. So this was a tail sitter. So um, he was trying to modify that basic tail sitter design such that, you know, he's got a prop on the nose and one behind it so that it can transition into forward flight into a pusher configuration with a more efficient uh, propulsion system than the one that lifts it off the ground vertically. So it got in the air, it kind of hovered. We didn't quite get so far as it tipped over into forward flight, but we call it a success because it did fly with control. And then um, over here in the middle with the black box in the front, we got another intern. He was from Virginia Tech. Um, he was comparing performance of two similar VTOL type drones, vertical takeoff and landing, uh, transition to forward flight, and performance of different uh, engine or motor and propeller combinations. So um, as, you, as you noticed, we, we take people from all around. We had two University of Maryland, Purdue, Virginia Tech, and College of Southern Maryland represented last year. So operational flight support. So we work with, um, and I've talked about this, with public entities such as NOAA, NASA, the Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, sometimes the state, Maryland State Police, first responder organizations, and, we'll, and, and when there's an idea to use UAS for an innovative purpose, we'll work with them. Um, we can sometimes do things with new airframes. We've worked with a lot of private companies on that kind of thing. They come up with a design, and they're not real familiar necessarily always with the flight <clears> test. <throat> but we'll help them build out a flight test program and go kind of get, the, get the, uh, the flight laws worked out and get their autopilots dialed in for them, that kind of thing. Um, and then payload integrations, we, we do this all the time, so taking existing UASs and integrating the payloads. We also look at airworthiness. So we are an aviation organization, and you know my background is, uh, as mentioned, I flew helicopters for 30 years in the Navy, was around helicopters all my life, uh, my professional life, and you know safety of flight is always the first thing we talk about. Um, and you know we, we feel the same way. We, we have an, a very active safety program. Um, as part of that safety program, we want to make sure that the aircraft we're flying are you know, airworthy. In other words, they're safe to fly. Um, that is not always the case in the UAS industry. Um, some of these things are not really as well designed as you might like them to be. Um, we've all seen things kind of go wrong for no obvious reason. Now, you know, you build them yourself, you figure you're gonna kind of have that kind of thing happen to you, but uh, when you go buy them, you think they're gonna be good, not always so much. So we try to take a look at any new system that we have. We have a, uh, an airworthiness process that's based on what the Navy does, what the DOD does. Uh, it's scaled down, but it takes a hard look at various parameters uh, when we go out and, and, and understand and build checklists for using those things. You had uh, several thousand dollars worth of drones that just yeah. do things that you wouldn't think they would do. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's right. When you go start messing around with the software, right? You never, you know, sometimes something goes wrong for you. So you want to make sure that the drone itself is going to work first. Um, I mentioned Chesapeake UAS Route Network. So this is a uh, project that's it's a long-term project. Getting to a place where we can operate UASs in the state of Maryland um, on demand, in other words, you know, you don't have to go and get waivers from the FAA with a long lead time as you often do now if you want to go beyond the visual line of sight of the, observe, of the operator. Um, you know, I talked about part 107, you got to be able to keep eyeballs on it. If I want to go farther away or if I want to fly it behind something and get, you know, and obstruct my view of it, I now need to go get a, a waiver from the rules, from the FAA. Um, you know, they advertise 90 days to do something like that. Well, there's no way you're going to build an industry or a business off of that. So working to try to, with, with others too, because there are initiatives going on around the country on this, but to, to get to a place where we can have on-demand access, where the, we're not segregating manned and unmanned aircraft, okay? We're allowing them to operate in the same airspace at the same time. Um, a, a number of other objectives. But the idea is to build this thing in slowly, crawl, walk, and run. We have funding this year from the state of Maryland, uh, economic development funding from Department of Commerce. So we're in the process of modifying some aircraft right now that are going to support this project, um, big ones, penguins. And 
uh, working with the Navy, working with FAA, and working with others to start this project and, and take it out in the real world. The idea here is that we would connect up points of interest around the state with a pre-established route system, and this is just kind of the idea of what that might look like. And, um, and, and, and you'll notice that it's largely over water, and that's for a very deliberate reason. So FAA's biggest concerns when UAS are up or flying is risk to people on the ground and risk of running into other aircraft. So if you can fly over water and over sparsely populated areas, you significantly reduce the risk to the ground. And now you've you know, limited your real challenges much more because you, you know, you're only really worrying about that air to air risk. Um, so I already talked to the beyond visual line of sight and on demand aspects, non-segregated, manned and unmanned together, but also not just small. So you know, a lot of the rules now are focused on small UAS under 55 pounds. Um, there is a, a big need, or there's a, there's a big niche for larger aircraft as well. You know, a route system like this might involve, you know, large cargo carrying drones, you know, thousands of pounds um, that could, you know, replace in some cases the trucks that are doing deliveries now. Um, they might be, you know, when you think about, you know, drone deliveries to the doorstep, you know, that's kind of a hub and spoke model, pretty short range. Um, but what about supplying that distribution center where that hub of the hub and spoke are? So you might do that with electrically powered drones, large cargo drones. Um, flying over people is a big concern of, about FAA, and that gets down to safety. Um, they have rules on it now, but it's extremely restrictive. And then U.S. traffic management is, is about how you're going to safely operate large quantities, large volumes of aircraft in the airspace at one time keep from running into each other, basically. And there's a lot of aspects to that. There are companies out there working on that as well. But that needs to be integrated into this route network concept. So what do we have? So some of the systems that we have, um, that picture over on the right, you know, shows some of the things that we have and some of the things we have had. Uh, over on the left, that's our, our current kind of main uh, multi-copter. It's about 55 pounds, it's about five feet across. So if you want some scale on that. Um, and so that has the ability to fly about 30, 40 minutes with a five kilogram payload. Um, that same payload, we can fly it about two and a half hours with uh, this, oh, I don't see that. This is a, actually a gas generator. So we can take the batteries out and generate the electricity on board from a small gasoline powered generator and significantly extend the duration. In flight. Uh, and I just listed up there, we have a number of other systems, everything from little stuff, you know, like you're going to buy at Best Buy, all the way up to that H6, and then um, you'll see here in, in a moment some other photographs of our large fixed wing. And so this is just some of what we have in the hangars. Um, bottom left there, that's one of the Harris H6s in the foreground. In the back there and in the center, that's a Penguin B. That's going to be our primary Chesapeake UAS route network platform. That's right around 55 pounds in its basic configuration. Um, that is being converted from a runway, you know, wheeled aircraft requiring a runway for landing. Um, we're converting it into a vertical takeoff and landing. And then it has a pusher motor that takes over up and away in flight. And then you take advantage of the efficiency of a fixed wing. And so that can get you about six hours of endurance. Um, it's not really targeted at carrying payloads. It's really, it's, it's an airspace kind of research project. So we're putting radios into it now. Autopilots are going in now. We're going to experiment with different detect and avoid systems to try to detect other aircraft and, and appropriately react to those to avoid collisions. So those kinds of things will be done with that aircraft. Um, also on those racks, you'll see many other types of aircraft. Um, again, they, some of them go back to projects past. Uh, the, the trailer there is our mobile operations center. So um, that was originally configured to work with Tiger Sharks, which are the large aircraft you saw in that other photograph. Um, that, that was a Navy project. Um, the interior of that contains you know, operator stations and displays. 
We're getting ready to reconfigure it for that Chesapeake UAS route network project. This will be our op center for that. And we'll, that's where we're going to run and control aircraft from. Just a you know, snapshot of some of the some of the companies and some of the agencies we've worked with, just to kind of show you it's pretty broad. Um, so a few things we've done in the past. So back in 2019, uh, the U.S. test site um, did the first ever transport of a viable human organ um, down here in Baltimore in conjunction with the University of Maryland's Medical Center up there in Baltimore. So if you've ever driven around the Inner Harbor and you've seen the hospital down there, there's a helicopter pad up on the roof. Uh, so they, they, they launched from about three and a half miles away in the middle of the night, um, flew across the city. Uh, they chose a route that, again, was flying over uh, railroad tracks, other kinds of right-of-ways where there weren't people underneath it. Um, it was a pretty extensive program. It took about 16 months to design and build a 100% tailor-made, custom-made aircraft that carried that, that human organ. Um, it was then monitored with some systems that were designed you know, for that very mission. And, um, you know, that aircraft was built with full redundancy across the board. So everything was duplicated. Engine, the motors are duplicated. The rotors are duplicated. Um, it has dual radios, dual antennas. And then it had a last-ditch parachute if it needed it. And, and it was tracked with, uh, with the director my predecessor was riding along with Baltimore PD. And they were driving along below it. And so the idea was that if something went wrong, it would parachute to the ground. They'd run out and grab it because that organ still needed to make it to the hospital. And so that kidney actually went into a woman who's still with us today. And so that was a pretty groundbreaking thing. Uh, it led to the, the foundation of a company called Mission Go, which is up out of Baltimore. Mission Go is still a very successful company. They just won a large contract in California recently. Um, uh, another one called Medigo, which is now... Um, scheduling they, they were recently sold and so they are uh, they're, they're doing scheduling for medical delivery and and, and, and uh, not just drone delivery of organs but deliveries of organs in general um, if, if you're familiar with organ transplants time is absolutely of the essence every minute counts from the time it's harvested till it gets into the recipient and so optimizing the path of that getting from one place to another is what this is all about Drones have the ability, of course, to hop over traffic, get through the you know get through the city um, congestion, and you know save minutes getting from an airport. So, so it's pretty pretty cool project. Uh, NASA, we worked with NASA on a sea ice um, project over. Oh, I'll show you some pictures. If you look up in the top left corner there, three year project started out in the labs with them. So the idea here is that there are satellites flying with payloads that measure sea ice extent. They also measure its thickness, believe it or not. Um, but they calibrate those measurement sensors with humans walking out on the ice and drilling holes. But they have to do that while the, the, the field of view of that satellite passing over is actually sweeping across where they're standing with their drill. As you can imagine, you can't get a lot of data points you know, with that thing on orbit as it's getting around. So they said, what if we could do that calibration, flying a drone somehow using sensors, and we could get far more data points. So this project started in the lab. It went up to, um, to the Great Lakes um, one winter. And then last winter, these are the guys on the ice in Nome, Alaska, and, and flying the project out there this last winter. Um, below that, kind of the opposite end of the spectrum, that's Hawaii. Uh, that's another satellite-based project, which we did for National Oceanic and Atmospheric. And so that is the search and rescue satellite system. If you've ever, you know, seen an emergency locator beacon, you're familiar with them from airplanes. Boats have them. Hikers carry them. Uh, so if you get in trouble and you set off this beacon, it sends a signal up. The satellite picks it up, triangulates your location, and passes it off to the, the, the search and rescue organization that's closest to you anywhere in the world so that they can get out and start looking for you. The problem is the current generations of these satellite payloads that are flying are not super accurate. So they're flying a new generation. We were helping them to calibrate those systems. And so we did that in New Zealand. We did that in Australia. Did it in various US sites, including Hawaii. That's actually New Zealand in the top right corner. Um, we don't solely restrict ourselves to aircraft. That little 
unmanned surface vessel there. You see the orange one was used as part of the SAR satellite project as well. They wanted to see it like from a moving vessel. So we worked with our friends in the Coast Guard down in, in Southern Maryland to take that out in the waters near us and, and operate it. And then in the bottom right corner, that's just us working with our local Navy friends. Um, they're evaluating different types of small drones for various purposes. And we act often as a third party independent evaluator so we, we can stand between them and these companies that are making, that are offering their products, right? So we'll build out a data card and we'll go out and put each of those aircraft through the same paces and then hand that data over to the Navy and they can make decisions on what they want to do next. Some of the stuff we're working on now, um, I mentioned this before Artemis, so this is you know, multi-agent systems, so we're talking about um, drones talking to each other and, and interacting with one another and, and planning their next course of action uh, autonomously. And so this is a DARPA, or yeah, this is an Army Research Lab project, um, and they, they typically run the, uh, the, the major project every August uh, up at Aberdeen Proving Grounds, up in Baltimore. So we've been doing that for a couple of years now. This is coming around into its third year and we're getting ready to use Chimera, as mentioned before, as part of this project. DARPA Triage is a brand new project. So Artemis is led by Dr. Paley. Uh, so will be this DARPA Triage project. The idea here is that in a mass casualty, you know, deciding who, you know, first responders should get to first, whether this is, you know, in a combat zone, whether it's after an earthquake, whatever, you know, that triage, you know, who is, you know, going to be okay, they can wait, who's already too far gone, there's nothing we can do for them, who needs to be cared for first. So that's the triage process. And so, you know, using a drone to go and quickly assess that situation and direct the first responders is the goal of this challenge. The team is called RoboScout that's going to be doing that. And that's, uh, that's going to be kicking off here very shortly. We just you know, found that we're, we're going to be doing that. And uh, in fact, one of our interns this last summer was uh, Dr. Paley's intern, and um, uh, Ben Cacci. And he, he did a project that used a time of flight camera, a very inexpensive infrared camera, to, uh, to check for respiration and for, um, for, for heart rate uh, on, a, on, a, on a person. And so, one of our engineers volunteered to be that person. We built a cage around him so this thing could hover over him, and, uh, and it actually worked. And so we had some success with that. So that's gonna get extended into that DARPA triage project. Namaste is a project for NASA. So they want to know why there is methane on Mars. And so now with the Ingenuity drone, which has flown on Mars successfully, we know that we can fly rotor-powered drones on Mars. And so they're thinking, how can we use that to find out why is methane in the atmosphere? It can have organic origins or it can have chemical ones, you know? And if this is a sign of once life on Mars, you know, that could be a sign. Um, we know from Earth that methane vents, you know, in the summertime out of the permafrost up in the, in the Arctic. And, you know, they see those kind of diurnal variations on Mars as well. So there's a possibility that this is organic in nature. So we're going to act as a surrogate for, um, for NASA here flying drones in Alaska in the summertime this time to go look for these methane plumes with the sensors they're developing. And this is again going to use multiple aircraft talking to each other kind of in that Artemis sort of way um, and, and also interacting with the ground rover. Um, Wildfire XPRIZE, you may have heard of that. So that just came from a meeting on this, as a matter of fact. If you're familiar with the XPRIZE, um, the, the, you know, and if you're familiar with what's going on with uh, extreme wildfire events, they're on the rise. The amount of money they're costing is on the rise. The amount of homes that are getting destroyed is on the rise. People are just getting closer to those wildlands where these fires happen. And so they're becoming more severe. And so there, there are a lot of efforts, actually. We're involved in three distinct wildfire efforts right now. The next prize is one of them. Um, the Wildfire Grand Challenge is something that we're part of a team of here with Fire Protection Engineering right on the campus. And, and uh, there's another we're doing with NASA as well. That was just proposed and we're gonna wait and see if that one's gonna win. So, so a lot of wildfire work going on out in the world today. 
And then medical package delivery. We're writing a grant proposal right now, along with the Maryland Department of Planning and, um, and, and a health delivery system on the eastern shore of Maryland. It's very rural. Um, you know, historically, they are very much underserved out there by the medical system. Um, a lot of people have a tough time getting their prescriptions. A lot of people have a tough time getting in to see a health care provider. Um, sometimes these kinds of things can be done remotely. We can do drone deliveries of medical packages, and we want to demonstrate that on the Eastern Shore. So we're going after a grant proposal, a grant right now, that would, would let us do that. And uh, mirror something that's happening right across the border with us on the Eastern Shore in Virginia. Um, and ultimately, we want to connect up Maryland Smith Island with Crisfield in Maryland. Smith Island has got about 250 people living on it, watermen been out there for a long time, but the only connection is by a boat. There are times of the year when it's pretty tough to get back and forth. They have telehealth out there. There aren't any doctors out there on the island, but they have telehealth capability. But if you need a prescription, how do you get that if, you know, the, the bay is iced over or if the winds are too much or the, or, or the waves are too high? Um, so drones are a great solution to that. So we're, we're working on that. That'll be a project done that needs to get through those FAA kind of approvals we talked about. So that's kind of what we're up to. So what can we do together? You know, that's the, the next thing I would ask. So really, when you guys are doing projects that are going to use UASs, I, I would, you know, ask you to think of us um, as potential advisors to you. You know, we, we're, we're always happy to talk. We're always happy to work with, with you know, faculty, with students that are working on projects using drones. We, if, if you're, you're going to do it, you've probably learned the hard lesson about what it is you're going to try to do already, and we can save you the trouble. Um, if you need a place to fly, you know, you, as you probably are aware, if you try to fly drones around here, if you're doing it around here and you haven't gone through a lot of steps with FAA to get permission, you're doing it illegally, just flat out, because we're in the flight restriction zone here. Um, and you're not allowed to get off the ground at all with a drone here without getting special permission. Uh, we're outside that area, so down at the at, at St. Mary's, we have airspace that's wide open to use. Uh, sometimes we fly at the airport. Typically, we've got a farm. Uh, we've got a local farmer who's been very generous to us, lets us use his, his place to take off and land. Um, we can get special permissions from the FAA as well to operate more widely. And back to the FAA. If you got any questions on operating legally, we can help you with that kind of thing. Um, we own a lot of assets. I think you saw in the hangar there, and that's just a sampling of what we've got. So we may have what you need already, and that can save you money on your projects. Um, and we certainly have the ability to help you to integrate and modify things. Um, and you know, if you're going to go out and try to find things, uh, you, you may find that online, um, there's a lot of claims made by a lot of people in the drone industry. Um, a lot of those websites aren't much more than a website, and a lot of those products are not much deeper than a website. So we, we have pretty good knowledge of what's in the market, what's legit and what isn't, and can kind of help you sort through that stuff too. I mentioned the internship, so I won't say any more about that, but I will just say too, we'd love to have you come down and see what we got down there. And so we're always happy to host a visit. Um, if you wanted to get a group together at the Robotics Center to come down, we'd love to host that. Um, there is also a facility down there you may have heard of called the Smart Building. Um, and that's also a wonderful thing to see if you haven't seen it yet. That also belongs to the university down there. So that's it. That's what I've got. Any questions for me? Great. Thank you. All right. Um, so how about like teaching? Uh, have you supported teaching activities on campus here. So you mentioned that you're supporting some uh, classroom instruction uh, at the smart building. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if I were to, for example, offer a course that you want to get people flying, mm -hmm. perhaps locally here, are there ways that you can support uh, those operations? We can certainly talk about it. So if you're, um, you know, I usually each year I'll come up and I'll talk to Eni 100, you know, the, 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 the freshman class in, in, in Aero. But um, I've also given seminars to, you know, the agriculture and, and natural resources guys, talking to all the agriculture extension agents next week. I'm going to be in uh, next week um, 
uh, talking to the, the aero engineering course that I mentioned. Um, so GIS, all those folks. Okay. Yeah. So, so we can help out. We don't offer training per se, but you know, we can give advice on where to go get training if somebody wants it. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I'll connect offline and I'll put you guys together. Okay. Any other questions? You yeah. um, mentioned uh, air and um, water vehicles, but do you have any ground vehicles as well? So we don't have any ground vehicles right now. So at the smart building I mentioned, which is about a half mile from us, they have a facility there that um, it's an indoor facility, but adjacent to it, right outside the glass, they have what they call a, an unmanned ground vehicle playground. So it's got obstacles and, and varied terrain. And then we're also located kind of with wooded areas around that also belong to the facility. So you can navigate through there. They have a couple of unmanned ground vehicles there. They've brought down Spot and some others as well, so we have the ability to do that. Are the internships mainly for undergrads or like even grad graduate students can? They're under. They, these are undergrad internships. Yeah. So uh, very recently we saw in robotics, like how companies are uh, uniting their interface using the robot operating system. So uh, what is the software platform that you use for controlling the uh, drones? Because um, some of the companies recently are trying to migrate to the same robot operating system for controlling drones as well. So is there a similar platform that you use at UAS? So, you know, I, I'm going to say that we don't have a single singular system that we use. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I would I would definitely refer you to our project engineer who can speak to that much more wisely than I can. Um, you know, we work with you know different types of autopilot, Piccolo's, you know, uh, Pitak, uh, RD Pilot, and others most most commonly. But as far as the the you know yeah the technical question, I'm going to kick that over. For um, the systems that you have. Uh, do you have any um, like specific simulation environments that you use for them? So that, for example, um, driving from here to, yeah. um, I think you said Mary County? St. Mary's. Yep. St. Mary's County is a far drive, right? So um, it would be beneficial for us to kind of uh, test things out in a simulation environment before mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. make the trip down. So uh, do you have like any, like, uh, environments that you use, maybe like Gazebo, but then you provide the software that runs on the drone so that we can test stuff in um, Gazebo or something equivalent? So we haven't typically done that. We tend to be more operationally focused. So as part of that current project, we're buying some, some new simulation equipment. We've just bought the new hardware for that, the computers to support it. We're waiting for delivery of this uh, simulation environment for those penguins. Uh, from a, a company called Simlat, so um, but you know, I think again, you know, it's it's not out of the question that we could we could set up something like that, but it would have to be done as part of a project, I think. Yeah. Okay, one final question: Do you have a um, web page for all the materials and so forth that um, is available? So um, if you go to our web our, our website is, is UROC and um, you know I I can uh, this is UROC.com and uh, you Google it you'll find it. So if you go there you'll be able to find contact information for us. What I'd ask you to do is just shoot an email you know to the the general inbox down there, and it's you know we we have you know typical UROC.edu I think is the UMD.edu or something like that, but at any rate, uh, send us an email, we'll get you in contact with the right person, and work with you. Okay. Thanks. Awesome. Well, if there are no more questions, thank you. Okay, thank uh, you. This is uh, yeah, very important.